I spend a lot of time underwater breathing compressed air and thinking about what exactly I'm seeing. Since beginning my diving career in 2011, I've completed over 1400 scientific dives in some relatively chilly and challenging waters. I've had the opportunity to descend beneath the surface in some of the most remote yet splendid corners of our globe. Attu Island in the far western Aleutian Islands, a number of islands across the archipelago, the perimeter straits and islands of Puget Sound, and the rough and exposed Oregon coast. But most of my time underwater has been spent here in California, spanning from Humboldt to the Channel Islands and all the way down to San Diego. And I can tell you that the waters of California are truly exceptional. And for most all of these dives, I was there to study one of our most precious yet underappreciated aquatic resources, kelp, or more generally, algae. We have long forgotten our roots and become just detached from the ecosystem to which first gave us life. This resource was not only fundamental to our existence then, but is the crux of our existence now and as we look towards the future. And that algae is part of our story in chapters forgotten. Let's elaborate. In grade school, we were taught that the first humans arrived in the Americas some 13,000 years ago, seen here in this map in blue, by an overland route across Beringia Land Bridge, then followed south to the Great Plains where the Clovis people hunted large game and thus were able to proliferate and expand further into the Americas. However, this theory has been nearly debunked by another hypothesis. Recent archaeological finds now suggest that pre-Clovis people arrived prior to 13,000 years ago and did so via the Kelp Highway, seen here in red. Most striking to this theory is that the first Americans followed the Pacific Rim via boat, not by land as previously accepted Clovis first theory suggests. Anthropologists dubbed this theory Kelp Highway because incredibly rich kelp forest ecosystem traced nearly the entire route of the Eastern Pacific and could have supported these seafaring peoples. They also went on to say kelp ecosystems extend as far south as Baja, California, and then the gap in Central America where productive mangroves and other aquatic habitats were available picked up again in northern Peru where again the cold nutrient rich waters from the Humboldt current supported kelp forests extending as far south as Tierra del Fuego. And so why did I get into this long story of how humans probably followed marine algae all the way through the Americas? That's probably because humans continue to do that throughout history. Fast forward to the colonization of the Americas. In the early 1700s, mostly Russian, but also American and British vessels navigated the kelp highway, not in search of kelp itself, but what the kelp supported and was home to, fur, and specifically, but certainly not exclusively, the otter pelt. And so it went. Expert fur trappers, the Aleuts, were enslaved and sent on the road down the kelp highway aboard these fur-crazed vessels. And by the 1840s, the sea otter populations of California were exhausted to the point of ecological extinction. The coast lost a keystone predator in a matter of 35 years. And this remained as such until a small population was found off Big Sur Coast near Bixby Bridge in 1938, about 100 years after their disappearance from these waters. And this sighting was important because it confirmed that the California otter was indeed still in existence. And so federal protection efforts were achieved with the North Pacific Fur Seal Treaty in 1911, and then followed by the Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1972, which is part of the reason why sea otters were able to recolonize Monterey Bay. However, the otters, the otters native range substantially decreased and have remained absent in areas north of San Francisco Bay and south of Point Conception. And Although the otter was unable to recolonize its native range, another mammal was certainly able to. Humans. As missions replaced native populations, our interactions with the sea changed. Missions became cities, and with that came more people, and with that came the development of fisheries to meet the new demands for these 
these lucrative marine resources. We reaped the benefits of the sea. The new coastal inhabitants became disconnected as to why those resources were even there to begin with until we lost the very resource that allowed us to proliferate at origin. Algae is home and a resource that fuels every single trophic level above it. And that includes us. Algae is our story. Although these global drivers all over the world could ultimately be affecting kelp forests at multiple scales via global warming, um, local stressors and regional variation in the effects of these drivers ultimately dominate kelp dynamics and everything else that is tied to that resource. So going off of that thought, what kind of regional stressors have hit the north coast of California specifically? Multiple stressors, both biotic and abiotic. We had a destabilization of the trophic food web via, like I explained, the loss of otters around 1840, and then the loss of sea stars to a disease beginning in 2013 and has been persisting ever since. This was then paired with marine heat waves via El Nino in 2015-2016 and the warm blob which formulated in 2014 and has been persistent until at least September 2019. And on top of that, we had a widespread recruitment of omnivorous purple urchins. All of these combined were too much for the already heat-stressed and predator-less Northern California kelp forest to withstand with, with itself as a kelp forest state. And thus, the ecosystem was pushed into another phase state known as an urchin barren. The pervasive purple urchin outcompeted fellow algae grazers like abalone and red urchin, not only for food, but space as well. And by 2017, the lucrative $44 million recreational red abalone fishery closed. In addition, the commercial red urchin fishery filed for disaster relief as the five-year average annual catch went from $2.6 million from 2011 to 2015 and dropped to about $500,000 by 2017, according to the state of California's gover governor's office. This not only is counting losses um, within that fishery, but this is not counting the losses to fish processors and the related services in the Fort Bragg area which support these fisheries and where most of this work occurs. And thus came community collapse, as the theme of this talk is that algae is part of our story. Campgrounds and hospitality entities are now empty when they would be filled with divers. Uh, TOT taxes for the town are way down and the alternate prey source fish are simply not biting. Um, and just this year, the last remaining dive shop between San Francisco and Humboldt just closed. What now? While we can't go back and never go back time in history and change our interaction with this sea, nor restore it to what it once was, we do have some options for the future. Kelp forest restoration has been practiced by humans globally for centuries. Here in Northern California, we're now pulling from these case studies, exploring methodologies, and comparing biotic and abiotic processes to ultimately elicit and catalyze a phase shift from urchin-dominated to algal-dominated of some composition reefs. Thinking about expectations a, a year from now, we may see simly, similar responses in succession to that of an ecosystem responding to a wildfire, a severe disturbance. After a disturbance, you first get your grasses, your small colonizers, then you get your shrubs, then you get your trees, and then you get the associated critters. However, we also know that depending on abiotic forces, the response of an underwater forest can be faster than that of a terrestrial forest, given the life history characteristics of marine algae and depending on the abiotic forces like uh, temperature and nutrient availability. And so we propose to conduct a restoration effort in three targeted locations not to fix the entire region of the north coast in itself, but instead create oasis for kelp, fish, abalone, associated critters. So if and when the ecosystem decides to take a turn, 
or even get pushed into a separate state, there will be some refuge of spores available and increase the genetic diversity of that pool. Funding from the Ocean Protection Council has allowed us to hire these commercial red urchin fishermen to come in these targeted locations and physically remove purple urchin. Um, and that funding will also support two additional restoration technicians to help monitor and focus and drive where these efforts are happening and where our time is spent. From the project management side, ReefCheck, the organization that I am associated with, is taking point on coordinating this cohesive approach um, between monitoring and removal efforts um, in very close collaboration with folks from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Ocean Protection Council staff, the Greater Fairlands Association, and many other partners. We aim to develop a hand-in-hand -hand approach between monitoring organizing commercial efforts and finding uses for harvested urchins to ultimately create this cohesive approach that can bring not only economic benefit, but ecological benefit to the folks of Mendocino County, as well as the greater state of California. In addition to uh, the, the workforce, a good percentage of this work will actually be driven by volunteer efforts, which is, which is awesome. Um, recreational scuba divers um, will be smashing urchin, purple urchin, via an emergency regulation at one of those uh, targeted restoration sites, Casper Cove. In addition, the Noyo Center for Marine Science, here based in Fort Bragg, who is great with outreach, um, will be assisting us with dockside monitoring via looking at the collections landi collection landings data brought in by the commercial red urchin divers and conducting public outreach at their locations here in town. And lastly, the Reef Check California Volunteer Citizen Scientists uh, will be helping monitor the succession and effectiveness of these urchin removal efforts. These recreational divers have been trained in scientific methods and they're gonna assist us with answering some of those um, fundamental succession questions. And so this entire restoration process um, has already and will continue to require all hands on deck. And I could tell you the folks of the North Coast are ready to go. And so in summary, although we can't go back to what once was, we can certainly look forward and we have some options. This effort aims to remove grazing pressure from those three targeted reefs in Mendocino County by utilizing the expertise of commercial red urchin fishermen. We will also be evaluating crushing versus harvesting purple urchin methodology to get a better understanding of which one of those methods are most effective and any unintended consequences that come with them. And lastly, we will ultimately assist in eliciting a phase shift we aim to from urchin to algal dominated by using the best practices demonstrated globally. In addition, this effort will bring divers and people to the North Coast to participate and create revenue for Mendocino via volunteer efforts, i.e. those smashing events and the monitoring side with reef check. It'll also create jobs for commercial red urchin fishermen and a couple budding subtitle ecologists. And it'll explore commercial avenues for these harvested purple urchin. I really look forward to this coming year and I really look forward to reporting back on how this effort develops over the coming year. I would like to thank, in addition, all the reef check divers that have assisted in getting this project off the ground and collecting data in this region for over a decade now, as well as all the many partners who have assisted this effort um, and of course our funding sources. And with that, um, I'm available via phone. Um, I'm also available via email, as you can see here. Please feel free to reach out, and I'm here to answer any questions you have pertaining to this effort. Thank you, and happy Earth Day.